Okay, so here we are moving further into chapter 17 on lipids. So far, we've just set the stage. We've talked a little bit about the different types of lipids, uh, the fatty acid types, the steroid types, uh, and we'll move into further discussion now uh, as we move deeper into the chapter. Okay, so in this lecture in particular, we're going to focus on the fatty acid lipids. Uh, if you recall from last lecture, we did uh, mention that the fatty acid lipids have four subclasses. So this is going to be a more exhaustive lecture than our very brief intro lecture last time. So hopefully you'll get your questions answered. And certainly if you continue to have questions, please uh, reach out to me and we'll make sure that you're A-OK -okay on fatty acid lipids. When we talk about fatty acids, as you recall, I'm sure from last lecture, uh, fatty acids contain long chain hydrocarbons with a carboxylic acid head group. Uh, they typically contain between 12 to 18 carbon atoms total. These are the naturally occurring fatty acids that are most popular. Uh, because uh, they're uh, having between 12 and 18 carbon atoms in general, they tend to be insoluble in water. That polar head group, that carboxylic acid group, uh, the C double bond O, single bond OH, um, that, that likes water quite a bit, but when you've got 12 or 18 carbon atoms to deal with, most of which are CH bonds, uh, as an overall molecule, it tends not to be soluble in water. And they can be saturated or unsaturated depending on what's going on with those carbon-carbon bonds. Uh, if they're all carbon-carbon single bonds and carbon-hydrogen single bonds, aside from our carbon-oxygen double bond there in the carboxylic acid group, that would be a saturated fatty acid. We could also have carbon-carbon double bonds there that would result in being unsaturated. Again, that carbon-oxygen double bond in the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid does not permit us to be classified as unsaturated. That double bond has to be there because of the carboxylic acid group, so don't consider that when you're thinking saturated versus unsaturated. Now, because these fatty acids tend to involve uh, quite a deal of, of carbon atoms, as we said, 12 to 18 is the norm, uh, we tend to see the formulas written as either condensed structural formulas or more commonly as skeletal formulas. So we see here a couple of examples of the condensed structural formula. So notice when we have those CH2 groups intervening there between the carboxylic acid head group and the CH3 terminus, uh, we tend to have just CH2 in parentheses and then a subscript to indicate the number of those CH2 groups. So, the, for example, 10 uh, would be a common um, number of CH2 groups to give us an overall carbon count of 12, right? The carbon of the carboxylic acid and the carbon of the CH3 uh, terminus, those would add two carbons to the 10 CH2 groups, so a total of 12, and we see two structural, uh, condensed structural formula representations, either with the C double bond O, single bond OH, or just COOH. Uh, then we see that condensed structural formula actually drawn out with the uh, 10 CH2s in there. And then finally, we see the skeletal formula, which is my preference. Uh, I think I've made that clear by now in the course. Um, and it's just, it, it looks good. It gives you all the information. It's quick and easy to draw. Uh, and hopefully by now, quick and easy to interpret as well. So um, I'd love you all to be there. Uh, but again, to be able to interpret the condensed structural formulas as well is a good skill to have. Okay, so the saturated fatty acids have only carbon-carbon single bonds. They're molecules that fit closely together in a regular pattern as we see those skeletal structures uh, one on top of the other down below. Uh, and they have properties similar to alkanes because they are mostly alkanes. When you're dealing with something that's 12 to 18 carbon atoms total, that uh, carbon uh, in the carboxylic acid head group doesn't really have much influence on the overall molecule. They tend to behave very similarly to alkanes. We see here stearic acid in particular, which is an 18 carbon uh, total uh, molecule. Again, C double bond O, that doesn't make it unsaturated. It's a saturated fatty acid because all the carbon-carbon bonding is made up of single bonds. So stearic acid, we see a melting point of 69 degrees Celsius. So at room temperature and pressure, this is a solid because of all those uh, carbons uh, being able to interact by the nonpolar van der Waals forces or London or dispersion forces as they're called. And we see our potato chips, those have been on a couple slides now, um, tend to be pretty rich in fatty acid residues.
Here we see table 17.1 with the structures and melting points of some common fat, fatty acids. So our smallest one here on the table, again, uh, we tend to see between 12 and 18 carbons total. So 12 would be lauric acid, and that's uh, primarily from coconut oil. Uh, it has a melting point of 44 degrees Celsius, so that is a solid at room temperature and pressure. Uh, but as you look, when we go up to myristic acid, which is 14 carbons total, palmitic acid, which is 16 total, and then steric acid, which we saw on the previous slide, that's 18 carbons total, notice that the melting point climbs. They're all solids at room temperature and pressure, but uh, they ha have higher melting points as we extend the carbon chain. Now, of course, these are all saturated uh, fatty acids, so uh, that's why we're able to make that comparison. As we increase the number of carbon atoms, we increase the melting point. That's true within the fat, the saturated and within the unsaturated, but once we mix saturated un and unsaturated, then we have to be very careful about that. Notice these tend to be um, from, uh, for the, uh, the steric acid, tends to be from animal fats, uh, whereas the other ones tend to be from um, very um, solid-like plant sources like coconut or palm oils. So now that we hopefully have our minds wrapped around the idea of saturated fatty acids, let's talk about the unsaturated fatty acids. So to be an unsaturated fatty acid, you have to have one or more carbon-carbon double bonds within the fatty acid residue. So uh, naturally occurring fatty acids have one or more cis double bonds. And so we see that on the left, uh, we have cisoleic acid with a carbon-9, carbon-10 double bond. Uh, and what makes it cis is that the hydrogens are on the same side and the carbon groups are on the same side. Um, and it looks, um, you know, sort of like a, uh, I don't know, a hairpin or uh, it, it just looks like a very uh, awkward structure, actually. But that's what nature prefers for fatty acids. If we look to the right, we have transoleic acid where we have uh, the um, hydrogens on opposite sides uh, and the carbon groups on opposite sides, that looks more compact. It, it just looks better, symmetrically speaking, perhaps. Um, but again, nature does not prefer that. And actually, the trans fatty acids do not work as well in the body. There's um, a lot of research that links trans fats to um, heart disease and, and other uh, maladies that um, mainly due to the fact that they're not natural. They're the way that chemists would make things because they're the way that, that uh, the chemically modified, the hydrogenated uh, fats tend to end up leaving some trans fats behind. Uh, but nature prefers cis, and um, now that manufacturers have to disclose the amounts of trans fats, if they, they're more than half a gram or whatever, uh, you tend not to see many trans fats at all. Uh, because um, cis fats are what's preferred in nature, and trans fats do seem to have health consequences. So moving further into the unsaturated fatty acids, let's look at the monounsaturated fatty acids. So unsaturated fatty acids with one double bond are called monounsaturated, mono for one, uh, and um, these tend to uh, be... Um, popular, <laughs> I guess we'll say it's stable, fairly stable, uh, because uh, of course the saturated fatty acids are the most stable. They chemically behave just like the alkanes. They don't have much opportunity for any other reactions. Uh, well, the monounsaturated fatty acids, because they have just the one double bond, they tend not to do a whole lot of chemistry either. So they tend to be fairly stable. Uh, your big sources, if we look at the palmitoleic acid uh, that's a 16 carbon atom total that's uh, primarily from butter so uh, mostly an animal source although it is an unsaturated uh, monounsaturated fatty acid oleic acid uh, the principal component of olive oil uh, as well as pecan and grapeseed um, good old 18 carbon total the carbon 9 carbon 10 double bond there we see it with the cis uh, configuration uh, that's uh, our um, classic uh, monounsaturated fatty acid and notice the melting points for both of those 0 degrees Celsius and 14 degrees Celsius are below the standard uh, room temperature of say 20 to 25 degrees Celsius so these are oils they're um, uh, liquids at room temperature and pressure uh, as the plain old fatty acids now the other type of unsaturated fatty acid we get would be a polyunsaturated, and these would be unsaturated fatty acids with more than one double bond. So uh, we make that big jump. If there's one, we call it mono. If there's two, we call it poly. Uh, but that's just the way it is. 
uh, it's easier than uh, making a whole bunch of distinctions. So if we look here in uh, this table, 17.1, we've got some polyunsaturated fats like linoleic acid, linolenic acid, arachidonic acid. Um, these are um, even lower melting points because of the multiple double bonds. Uh, so uh, as you see here, uh, when you have um, more double bonds, you get lower melting points. So these uh, tend to all to be oils uh, at room temperature and pressure. Uh, and sometimes they're from uh, animal sources, meat, eggs, fish there you see for their acidonic acid. Uh, but largely we tend to think of polyunsaturated fatty acids as coming from plant sources. Uh, they can also go rancid uh, much more readily than monounsaturated fats because you have plenty of double bonds for um, oxidation to occur. And so that's where you have to be careful. You want to store these um, in the fridge. You want to uh, use them fairly quickly within opening. So uh, you don't run that uh, chance of them to uh, go rancid or have side reactions or any such thing. So as a recap, let's go back to the saturated fatty acids, uh, remembering that saturated fatty acids tend to fit closely together in a regular pattern. That's what allows them to uh, be uh, nice and aligned that uh, gives rise to those significant dispersion forces between the chains that we talk about here as our second bullet point. As a result of, of those significant dispersion forces, we have higher melting points. So these tend to be solids at room temperature. So your saturated fatty acids tend to be solids at room temperature and pressure, regardless of the length of the chain, as long as it fits within that 12 to, 12 to 18 uh, typical range. Uh, they're all solids at room temperature because they all align nicely and they can therefore have significant dispersion force interactions among the different chains. Now, if we look at the unsaturated fatty acids, because in nature they're cis fatty acids, they have those kinks in the fatty acid chains, and that does not permit close packing. That results in a much um, more loosely packed structure. It allows, therefore, for fewer attractions between the chains, fewer of those dispersion force interactions. And as a result, you see uh, lower melting points, and they tend to be all liquids at room temperature. Um, and again, depending on how many uh, unsaturations there are, they can be uh, liquids well below room temperature uh, or uh, roughly at, uh, just below room temperature if we're dealing with the monounsaturated fatty acids. Let's pause here for a learning check. In this learning check, you're asked to assign the melting point of minus 17 degrees Celsius, 13 degrees Celsius, or 69 degrees Celsius to each one of the following 18 carbon fatty acids, and then list the fatty acids in order from highest to lowest melting point and explain your reasoning. So here we see the three fatty acids. Uh, hopefully you remember the um, um, differences. Uh, I haven't asked you to commit them to memory, so just remember oleic acid is a monounsaturated 18 carbon. Uh, steric acid is a saturated 18 carbon, uh, and linoleic acid is a polyunsaturated 18 carbon chain. So hopefully that will allow easier assignment of these melting points and explanation as a result of those ordered uh, highest to lowest melting point rankings. So stop the video here, make your determination, and start it back up when you're ready to check your work. Good luck. All right, so hopefully with my little bit of help reminding you that they're all 18 carbon fatty acids and that steric acid is saturated, oleic acid is monounsaturated, and linoleic acid is polyunsaturated, uh, you are able to uh, find the uh, correct melting point order, steric acid is going to be your highest melter at 69 degrees Celsius. Uh, oleic acid is going to be um, in between uh, with a melting point of 13 degrees Celsius because it has the one unsaturation. We'd expect it to be a melting point below 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, but uh, again, just below. And then linoleic acid, because it has the two unsaturations, we'd expect it to be the lowest melting. And our choices here uh, left us with minus 17 degrees Celsius. So um, that pretty much explains it. The more unsaturations, the lower the melting point. Uh, and uh, that has to do, of course, with the uh, uh, kinks provided by those unsaturations as uh, allowing for less significant overlap and uh, less uh, significant uh, London or dispersion forces as a result.
Okay, so up until now we've talked mainly about just the fatty acids uh, in general. Uh, let's look at another group within those fatty acids, and that's the prostaglandins. Uh, prostaglandins have 20 carbon atoms in their fatty acid chains, just like that arachidonic acid. Uh, they differ by the substituents attached to the five carbon ring. So if we look at the arachidonic acid, that was our 20 carbon one, right? It was unusual because we said they tend to be 12 to 18 carbons, uh, but this one was 20. Uh, and we notice here as we go to prostaglandins, we end up with a five-membered ring and we end up with some hydroxyl groups. And so uh, there's uh, the key structural feature. Um, PG1 there has uh, a... a uh, ketone group as well there on carbon 9. Uh, so uh, we've got some different uh, structural possibilities, but they tend to be um, characterized by the 20 carbons and the 5 carbon ring. Okay, so why do we care so much about the prostaglandins? Well, they have very potent physiological effects. Some will increase blood pressure. Strangely, some will lower blood pressure, even though they're structurally quite similar. Uh, some stimulate uh, contractions and relaxation of smooth muscle in the uterus during the birth process and menstrual cycle, so obviously uh, important there for females. Um, if you have uh, injury, tissues, uh, when they're injured, uh, that arachidonic acid in the blood is converted into uh, PGE1 and PGF2 that will produce inflammation and pain in the area of the injury. So uh, obviously uh, that's something that uh, we've evolved to have happen, and uh, unfortunately it tends to be unpleasant to have that inflammation and pain. So uh, understanding more about the prostaglandins will help. Uh, of course, to understand more about how we treat inflammation and pain as a result of injury. So since uh, pain and inflammation tend to be undesirable things, one way that we've been able to block uh, the prostaglandin formation uh, is through the use of NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, and uh, some of these have been uh, known and used for a long, long time, such as aspirin. Uh, but the uh, other newer ones are, are also available, like a C, uh, like a ibuprofen, rather. Acetaminophen is not uh, technically an NSAID, uh, but uh, it is a commonly taken uh, medicine for uh, pain, inflammation, and fever. But uh, ibuprofen and um, the proxin would be other examples of NSAIDs that are used uh, for that purpose. And again, they do a nice job of decreasing pain for many people uh, and inflammation, although they don't work well for uh, chronic pain for some people, uh, but they do block those uh, prostaglandins. Uh, they also reduce fever, uh, which can be nice if um, you've ever run a high fever, you know how uncomfortable that is. So uh, this is one way that uh, we can combat the issue is by taking these NSAIDs to block the production of the prostaglandins, which cause that pain, inflammation, and fever in the first place. And so here we see some um, structures there. There's aspirin, our good old friend acetyl salicylic acid, um, ibuprofen, uh, which is commonly uh, known as Advil or Motrin as trade names, but ibuprofen is the generic drug name. And then naproxen is um, trade name is Aleve or naproxen. Uh, and we can see they all have similar structures. They all have that benzene ring, or in the case of naproxen, the two fused benzene rings. Uh, and um, they do a nice job of uh, blocking the prostaglandin formation, but uh, long-term use can result in liver, kidney, gastrointestinal damage, uh, especially aspirin is often used in a long-term regimen for um, uh, a blood thinner, for heart uh, decreased heart attack incidences and things like that. Uh, oftentimes they'll use really low dose or they'll do a buffered aspirin because it can be quite irritating to the GI tract. And so uh, you do have to consider those things when you're thinking about long-term use. Short-term use, again, it shouldn't be a big issue, but if you're going to take any of these things long-term, uh, definitely want to talk that over with your healthcare provider. Now, if you have heard a lot about uh, fatty acids, in particular the polyunsaturated fatty acids, you probably have heard of these omega-3s and omega-6s. Uh, well, uh, fish and vegetable oils tend to have high levels of unsaturated fats, and these seem to have some health benefits, so people are interested in consuming uh, a certain uh, 
amount of each of these daily. In the case of the vegetable oils, it tends to be omega-6. So this is a bizarre system for us uh, based on the chemistry we've learned so far. We know that the carboxylic acid group is the most important group that we've learned, and therefore it's the highest priority group, and it's carbon number one. Well, with the omega system, we're numbering at the last carbon. Uh, if, if you know your Greek letters, you start your Greek alphabet with alpha and you end with omega. So that's why when we're talking about omega-3, we're talking about the third one in from the end of the molecule, or omega-6 would be the sixth one in from the end of the molecule. The end of these fatty acid molecules would be that CH3 methyl group. So um, for the vegetable oils, uh, things like flaxseed oil uh, tend to be high in uh, linolenic acid or linoleic acid, uh, which is a... Um, omega-6. For fish oils, uh, we tend to see uh, that's our linolenic, uh, right? I miss, I miss said that earlier. It's the linoleic that tends to be in the vegetable oils uh, with an omega-6. The linolenic tends to be in the fish oils, and that's your omega-3 with the first carbon-carbon double bond at carbon-3 from the methyl group end, not from the carboxylic acid end. And so here we see some of those structures. We see uh, linoleic acid there is an omega-6, uh, and then it has another unsaturation later on. Uh, the arachidonic acid there, uh, also an omega-6, uh, but again, that one has multiple unsaturations. For the omega-3 fatty acids, we see now it's linolenic acid, um, and that's an omega-3. Uh, and then we also see icos, ooh, that one's a tough one, icosapentaenoic acid, uh, is um, another omega-3, and docasa hexanoic acid is an omega-3 as well. Uh, and look at lots and lots of unsaturations there. And your common terms are probably what you know these better as. Um, LA, AA, ALA, EPA, DHA, uh, I'm sure you've seen those a lot more than the full chemical name, but uh, this is a chemistry course, so we're not afraid of these names, even if they might seem a little overwhelming at first. Now, in particular, those omega-3 fatty acids uh, tend to lower the ability of blood platelets to stick together and thereby reduce the possibility of blood clots. So if you look at um, regions of the world where you have really a high seafood diets, uh, even if it's a high fat diet, you still tend to see lower incidences of heart disease. Uh, and um, that's because these omega-3s, by that ability to uh, decrease the uh, blood platelets uh, adhering to one another, uh, helps to decrease that heart disease. So these tend to be found in high amounts in salmon, tuna, herring, and so uh, places like um, Scandinavia and uh, other areas where you have um, a high fat content in the diet, but mostly from um, fish sources, you tend to see very low incidences of heart disease compared with similar diets in other parts of the world that have, you know, uh, roughly the same fat intake, but again, fat from more animal or plant sources, not uh, these nice omega-3 fatty acids that have sort of a protective um, function with the heart rather than a destructive function. Okay, so as we wrap up this second lecture on fatty acids, uh, let's uh, end with a learning check. This time you're asked to draw the condensed structural formulas, or better yet, the skeletal structures, for each of the fatty acids with 10 carbon atoms that follow. So first we're going to look at a saturated one, that should be the easiest, uh, then a monounsaturated omega-3, and a monounsaturated omega-6 fatty acid. So if you would draw those three um, fatty acids, again, it's 10 carbon atoms total uh, for each case. Um, stop the video while you make that uh, condensed structural formula or a structural, a skeletal structure drawing and start us back up when you're ready to check your work. Good luck. Okay, so hopefully you arrived at something, uh, if you went with the condensed structural formula anyway, that looks like each of these. So for the saturated case, you've got a total of 10 carbons. So there's the carbon of the um, carboxylic acid group, then there's the carbon of the CH3 group at the other end, and then in between you have eight CH2 groups. For B, a monounsaturated omega-3, you're going to have, uh, again, a similar structure to A, 
uh, only now you're going to count starting at the um, CH3 terminus. You're going to count in three. Uh, so CH3 group is number one, then your first CH2 group is number two, and then your next formerly CH2 group from the saturated becomes a CH double bond CH, uh, and then the rest are all saturated. And then finally C, instead of having that unsaturation between carbons three and four from the omega end, now we're carbon six and seven from the omega end, and it should look just like we see there. So hopefully that was pretty easy for you. Uh, again, that omega numbering uh, is unusual to us. We're uh, used to looking at the carboxylic acid carbon as carbon one, and that's the alpha carbon, uh, but we're dealing with the omega end of things here. So uh, we just have to be um, aware that things are a bit backwards here for fatty acid numbering. Uh, hopefully it went well. If it didn't go well and you're still not clear what's going on, please do get in touch. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Uh, but otherwise, if things are going well, then we'll meet again in the next part of chapter 17.